we're in for a special treat this morning. One of our good friends and uh, brothers here to, to Freedom Tabernacle is with us to uh, preach and minister for us, and we just love them so much. Tim's got his son Nathan with us again, and we're glad to have, have you back with us, Nathan. And um, we just appreciate his ministry. He's no stranger to Freedom Tabernacle. I know some of you have never heard him. You, you haven't been here you, you've, been, you've been coming since he's been here to the church, and um, you're in for a special treat. And um, it's just a great honor, a great honor, Tim, to have you with us. And I know that oftentimes after we hear somebody, we, we just say, man, I just want to bless that ministry. Because he travels all over, the, the, you know, all over, and uh, ministers and evangelizes, and, 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 and just some incredible things are happening. You know, this is the year that we've declared the year of increase, the year of increase. And we're seeing increase in things, miracles and healings. And I know that God's been doing some great, mighty things in your ministry. We've been seeing some incredible ministry of just some incredible healings and miracles that have been, been occurring. And so today when you leave, if you'd like to give into this ministry, there'll be an opportunity. There'll be some ushers in the back with an offering bag that you can give to this ministry. I know we've already taken up our tithes. But if you'll just make a check to Freedom Tabernacle, we're going to take all there. We're going, we want to bless this ministry with Tim Hines. So, Tim, it's an honor to have you again today with us. We love you. And, Nathan, we appreciate you coming to be with us at Freedom Tabernacle. Let's give him a big Freedom Tabernacle welcome as he comes to minister. Praise the Lord. Thank you, son. Good morning, church. Good to see you. Good to be back with you. I tell you, I have kind of a one word on my heart. Let me, let me just expand the screen real quick. Can I do that? And that word is wow. Amen. What a day yesterday, huh? Changing people's lives. That's what it's all about, isn't it? One at a time. One of the things that I'm really encouraging the body of Christ with this year is win one, disciple one. If we all win one and disciple one, you'd be surprised what would happen. Not only would, uh, you know, churches should never have a problem being full. If we just live the commission. We live the responsibility that we've been given as believers to reproduce what we've received. Right? Right? Amen. So um, I'm excited. I really am very excited. When pastor was exhorting you about sowing seed, I can only tell you what I sense in my spirit. I, I really sensed a strong grace on that. In fact, there's something that in me that wants me to prophesy debt free around here. <clears throat> because I've learned, Pastor Robbie, that money follows ministry. Okay? And if we will minister, that we'll, we will lack no good thing. Oh, I feel, I'm telling you, I, I don't want to get off on that, but I'm telling you, there's, there's a strong grace on it, sir. There really is. And I want to encourage you as congregants of this house. And I really, I really, it really resonated with me when he kept saying, this is our house. Man, I, I wanted to take stake in this place. I want to get some skin in the game. <laughs> I want to drive a flag in the ground or something. I don't know. You know what? I just I felt that appeal. You know what I mean? That this is your house. And, and, you know, thank God for what other ministries are doing elsewhere. But thank God for what God has told Freedom Tabernacle to do. Amen? And when we all do what God tells us to do, it gets done. It gets done. Amen. So I want to encourage you with that. 2019, what an incredible year it is. It really is. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people prophetically that don't really understand what's on the table, okay? Now, I will tell you, let me break down the number real quick. 20 is uh, the number that speaks of redemption. And 19 is the number that speaks of faith. And I think that redemption and faith runs hand in hand real strong. Okay, and I really believe that there was there, there, this is a year to capitalize on. Okay, the year of increase. Now, however, God is going to increase you. I, I, I that's that's between you and Him. Okay, but there are some things that I really want to just deposit in part to you, so that you understand the clarity of what God's up to. Would that be all right? 
Okay, so I believe that God is redeeming the time. Now, there are covenants in the Bible. There are nine covenants in the Bible, the nine fruit of the Spirit, nine gifts of the Spirit. So this is a tremendous year of covenant and Holy Ghost activity in that covenant relationship. And it's working redemption as we begin to operate towards it and with it in faith. Because you have to remember something about faith. Faith has a character. It not only manifests the confidence of, of the character of faith in the moment, that that same confidence and character will wait on you down the road because faith doesn't change. Amen? Okay? So I want to encourage you, if you're dealing with a struggle, if there's a battle in your life, how many realize that there's nothing wrong with admitting that you're facing something? Wave at me if you're facing something. Okay? Let me encourage you. (laughs) The battle belongs to God. All you and I need to do is just keep our eyes on the right yes, sir. source, the, the right resource, right. right? One of my favorite parables in the Bible is found in Matthew 13. It's a very short, short parable. It speaks of a merchant man. And what did he do? He found a pearl of great prize. So what did he do? He sold everything. It's all right to help me preach. All right. I've been around you long enough, long enough to know that you're responsive. Okay, he sold everything, and I really believe that this is what God is asking out of His people right now. I've been using a campaign theme, and I see it on your T-shirts, and I'm wondering how you got a hold of my notes. All in, all in. How many realize what I'm saying is this house is hearing what God is saying abroad. Okay, so we have to be all in. He sold everything to get what he wanted. And the only thing that we have to do to line up with grace that will move us in the realm of success that cannot be kept from happening is to be doing what God wants us to do when he wants us to do it. Okay, why? Because you are the right people serving the right God at the right time. This is huge. God is, all God is asking us to do is to be in sync with him, yes. being cadenced with him. The battle belongs to the Lord. I'm going to show you something here in a minute. Okay? So if you understand that, then you realize <laughs> down in Florida, I, those people down there hustle everybody that comes into that state. <laughs> they take advantage of all kinds of you know, tourists, and, and they say, well, you know, this pearl starts from a grain of sand, and, and, and they, they make all these big, you know, uh, you know, uh, things to say, and and, and they swindle people, actually, when in reality, this type of pearl that we're talking about here, it grows to the size of eight millimeters. Now, eight is a very interesting biblical number. It speaks of new beginnings, new beginnings. Please hear me. How you finish this year is how you're going to start next year. Okay? So please listen to what I'm going to say. We have to remember that this type of pearl, it grows to the size of eight millimeters, but it starts when a parasite starts boring a hole through the shale of the oyster. There's an intruder trying to break in. But the, 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 the oyster is already prepared with something. It's, been, it's prepared with something called the mantle. All right, I'm going to pray that that just gets you with a wave, okay? And what happens is the oyster waits for that intruder to break in. And that intruder thinks because it's broke in that it's accomplished its task by killing the oyster. But in reality, when that intruder broke in, the mantle had surrounded it. Oh, I'm feeling something now. That mantle surrounded that intruder and started a new beginning with it. Oh, somebody help me. I'm trying to tell you that what's been trying to work against you is really working for you. I'm trying to tell you that what seems to have broken in and seems to be in charge, seems to be in control, seems to be dominating the present, it's just the moment of a turnaround. It's just the understanding that we need to come into and under and realize that that thing's been surrounded from day one and that mantle is going to take that intruder. Oh, somebody help me. I'm talking about the trouble you got in your marriage right now. I'm talking about the trouble that you got with your children right now. I'm talking about the struggle that you might be dealing with in your in your body right now. I'm talking about what might be going on with your money right now. Wherever the battle is, it's already surrounded. 
It's all... It's already working in your direction before you can see it. This is why we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. He's Alpha and Omega for a reason. It might not, it might not, be, we might not be too excited about how we start stuff. But it's process. Christians today are funny. They, they want easy streets. When every now and then we just need a battle. You need to be battle tested. You need to let God teach your hands to make war. Nothing wrong with that. Okay? Because it it develops something. It it shows you the potential that's in you. And I will tell you this. Believe in yourself the way God believes in you. Maybe not the way you believe in yourself or the way you believe in other people, but the way God believes in you. Because the potential that's down on the inside of you is unlimited. You and I are the ones that put the limits on. You and I are the ones that place the ceilings on our lives. Okay? So all God's asking out out of us right now is just to be in sync with him. Okay? Let's let's look at a verse of scripture. It's found in Genesis chapter 1. I love this passage. Genesis chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, iPads, surface pads, iPhones, whatever you have. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the lights, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. So if we understand this, we realize that God divides our time into days and years. He also said that this time division was to be for seasons of periods of time when certain things would happen or don't happen. So this is a season that God is simply telling us this needs to happen and this other stuff needs to stop happening. Okay? So let me read to you. Can I, can I just take a, a minute here and, and read to you out of the Message Bible? The Gospel of Luke. Now, this is very familiar to everybody in the room, I'm sure. Jesus has come into the, into the, uh, the temple, and he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And, and in the Message Bible, this is what the Bible says. And he came to Nazareth, or Nazareth, where he had been reared, as he always did on the Sabbath. He went into the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and the battered free. Verse 19. We're in the year of 2019. Verse 19 says this, to announce this is God's year to act. I said, this is, this is God's year to act. What I'm trying to tell you is if we will recognize the process and get our eyes off of the problem, we will see the potential that's at hand. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying here? God's changing our vision. Actually, can I be honest with you? God is giving the church right now 2020 vision. I'm talking about vision for 2020. The next year. Okay. So notice what the text goes on to say. And he rolled up the scroll and handed, handed it back to the assistant and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him intent. Then he started in. You've just heard scripture make history. You know, I'm in the south and y'all are way too quiet. Are you hearing me? I, I, you know, I'm, I, I got to go up north and preach to people that are just dead silent in church. <laughs> Ruin me before I get out of here. <laughs> Will you do it? You've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. 
So I pray today that scripture takes on history in your life this year. I pray today that this is the day that you begin to recognize what's going on, that you begin to discern what's taking place, and that you make the decision, the decision to allow God to bring to pass what he's declared. Now, what's on the table? I believe this. I believe that we're in a time where God's grace and favor and authority is operating real strong right now. And it's because there are some things that God has said over the last nine years that he wants to see happen before this year ends. How you finish is how you start. And we are contending right now. There are things coming after us. Grace is coming after us. Authority is coming after us. Favor is coming after us. Opportunity is coming after us. Listen, you know how you're going to pay for this place? By God prospering you beyond where you're at. Are you listening? So I think that God's trying to position some people with the right understanding. I'm not going to let this year close in my own personal life. There have been things that I have been waiting on for quite some time that God made the adjustment in my life at the first of the year with so that I could begin to posture myself correctly to see what God has said have liberty to come to pass in my life. Now, I had to get into alignment. Are you listening? All you got to do is just hit the right vein. Stay in your lane, bro. <laughs> right? So not only is there a lot on the table right now, in the sense of what God has declared, does anybody have something that God has said in your life that you haven't seen the fruit of yet? All right. Well, I want to encourage you to get more excited about it than you've ever been before because this is the year where Scripture is going to take on history. Yes. Amen. Second thing I believe that God is doing is he's asking people to win souls. And you'd be surprised how accelerated the first point would be if you were to engage in the second point. You know, sometimes all you have to do is just get involved with ministry. I believe that God is putting in your, in your heart to be more involved in ministry here than you ever have been before. Okay? And as you find your way into these positions, what will happen is God will, will begin to change your perspective. He'll change your priority. It won't always be about you. Can I encourage you? Worry's not going to do you no good. I know that's not very good English. I get that, okay? All right? But worry's not going to do you any good, all right? But if you'll get involved in ministry, what will happen is you'll get involved with faith. And if you get involved with faith, faith will do you a world of good. For those of you that are old enough or, you know, young people, I don't expect you to, to appeal to this, but faith down on the inside of you will do for you what a phone booth did for Clark Kent. Right? And the good news about faith is it's not so much the size of the dog that's in the fight. Mm, it's the size of the fight that's in the dog. Amen. Something's down on the inside of you that doesn't know how to lose. God hadn't lost a fight ever. David, when he was, when he was in, in control of Israel for 33 years, he never lost a battle. He knew something about praise. Amen. Joshua chapter 13 and verse 1 says this. He, now, you know, when you get a little older, you got to work a little smarter, you know. Okay, and Joshua said this. He said, I'm getting older and there seems to be so much more that needs to be done. And then he got a little frustrated in chapter 18, verse 3, when he told the nation of Israel, seven out of the tribes of, seven out of the 12 tribes of Israel basically had not done anything concerning the possession of their inheritance. And he, and he got frustrated with them. And he said, how much longer are you going to wait until you go in and possess your inheritance? And I find the church many times, you know, just maybe not knowing how to do it, but then again, maybe knowing how to do it and then just not taking the, the assertive to do it. But I believe that we're in a time where God wants us to go in and take what's ours. Are you listening? Amen? So what is your inheritance? I'm thankful that my inheritance, now that I'm a born-again believer, my, my ultimate inheritance is eternal life. But I have also an inheritance called everlasting life. I'm blessed in a cursed world. 
So I'm thankful that my inheritance is healing. I'm thankful that my inheritance is prosperity. I'm thankful that my inheritance is authority. I'm thankful that my inheritance is soundness of soul. I'm thankful my inheritance is that I can have a blessed family and, and just everything that God wants to do, the divine nature of God that's down on the inside of me. I'm thankful that I have an inheritance. But the greatest inheritance that you'll ever possess is winning souls. You might say, how is that? Psalms 2 and 8. Ask me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Proverbs 30 and verse 11 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls. Woo, come on, help shout it, preacher. You're wise when you win souls. It's almost like what you do for somebody else stimulates God to do something for you. You know, you reap what you sow. Amen. And you know, everybody today is an apostle or a prophet, and I think that they've lost their minds. Because if you know what this book says about apostles and prophets, you have no ambition to go there. Okay? Not an easy role to fulfill. But I think because the church is apostolic and prophetically founded in the realm of foundation, Ephesians 2.20, we must remember that the apostles and the prophets were the greatest soul winners in the Bible. In fact, generationally, he, Paul passed on to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse, uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5, he said, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. So these foundational forefathers understood what we needed to do to always be under an open heaven. Okay? We don't have to struggle. Most Christians struggle because they get their needs before God, what God wants. I will tell you that if you're involved with God, God, listen, don't you think that the one that makes that sun rise in the east and set in the west can take care of you? I got a feeling that he probably can do that. I'm just saying, okay? But I want to encourage you. There are things that the enemy will try and do to try and paralyze you and I moving forward, okay? Now, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 19, all right? We just got to keep our eyes in the right place, okay? 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. And they said to him, he's talking about Hezekiah, thus says Hezekiah. Now you have to remember before we go any farther, what Hezekiah did when he was confronted with this news is he went to the prophet Isaiah. Can I encourage you? Well, I'm going to encourage myself as I encourage you. Would that be okay? There are extreme efforts right now to try and distance the body of Christ from the prophets. It's just the truth. It's, it's the spirit that is trying to work. Something that is trying to capture the generation that exists in the church today. Okay? Now, there's a lot of variables, and I don't want to get sidetracked on that. And I will get to some things to, to, today. But, you know, one of the things that I really saw is in, in Matthew 16. Remember when Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was? Yeah. Isn't it interesting that James and John and Peter are with Jesus in the garden in Matthew 26 and that, you know, when Jesus came back the first time from praying, he didn't go to James and John. He went to the one that had a revelation. But when you back up and look at Matthew 16, you'll find that, that right after Peter's had this revelation, Jesus goes into a very short teaching on what he has to go and do. You see, it's just not enough to have a revelation of who he is. You got to have a revelation of what he needs to do. And what did Peter do? Peter began to try and stop him. Peter began to try and get in his way. You see, when you don't know what God needs to do, you'll try and get in his way. Now, let me encourage you. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a lot of people that have a misperspective here, okay? Because you got to remember something God will never rebuke you. You might say, well, isn't Hebrews 12 talk about the word rebuke? That's the, that's the Greek word that means instruction. God will never rebuke you. God will never judge you. You'll judge yourself. Now, ultimately, in the end, he'll judge you. But in this life, you'll judge yourself. Acts 13, verse 46. It was necessary that the gospel first be preached to you. But seeing that you've put it off, you've judged yourself. 
Okay, so we've got to, we got to understand that before I go, I'll go ahead with this. Because what did, what, what did Jesus do when Peter was trying to stop him from doing what he needed, he knew, what he, he knew he needed to do? What did he do? Peter, Peter tried to stop him. And, and what did Jesus? Jesus rose up and said, Get behind me, Satan. How many realize that he's not talking to Peter here? He's not rebuking Peter. He's rebuking Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but you're mindful of the things of men. What you're going to try and do is you're going to try and pull people out of revelation and muddy their souls in such a way that they get in the way of what I have to do. So what I'm trying to tell you is many times there was an activity that is clearing things up before we even come into the full understanding of the fruitfulness of the event. Okay, so with this in mind, this is why you got to hang out with people that are just are a little outside the box. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, prophets, I get it. Prophets are not always easy to be around. Now, it gives prophets no liberty, you know, to, to be mean to people, okay? All right? Most, most prophets that are mean to people are wounded. And Ezekiel chapter 3 says you better not prophesy if you're wounded because it won't go well for the people. You'll tell people that their camels are going to die in the desert and their goats won't give any milk anymore. And, okay? All right? But... <laughs> But prophets just need to look at themselves the way God looks at people. Amen? Okay, with this in mind, he goes to the prophet Isaiah, and the prophet Isaiah begins to coach him up, begins to encourage him, begins to give him some counsel to stay on track. Hey, listen, Hezekiah, stay close to your covenant. Stay in the light of the word. Understand that there is an act that has come upon you that is trying to paralyze not only you, but paralyze generations that are looking to you to be an example. Okay, so with this in mind, Thus says Hezekiah, this is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. And what I'm watching in America right now, and I'm just going to be honest with you, what I've been watching, I'm just being a little more vocal about it this year. What I'm watching in America is I am watching so many young people come to church and get discontented with church when that should not be the way. Are you listening? Okay. Because we have to understand, and I'll, get, I'll talk on this in just a little bit, but we have to remember that before any of this transpired, a messenger from the Assyrians had showed up. And he began to tell the people, the best thing for you to do is to sign a peace treaty with us. And then what we'll do is this. We'll just kind of let you stay where you're at for a while and then we'll come and take you out of your promised land and we'll bring you into the land that's almost as good. <laughs> kind of sounds like the devil. Can I encourage you, this is not a year to compromise in. This is not a year to strike a different deal. This is not a year to sign any kind of peace treaties. Okay, this is not the time to waver or to compromise in any way. This is a time to set your face like a flint and chase God and move with God and flow with God like you never have before. This is a time for you to stand up and tell the devil to shut up. This is a time for you to wave goodbye to yesterday because tomorrow is calling on you too strongly. Amen. Amen. All right, so now all of a sudden this guy starts to flex a little bit. Starts to say, hey, look, don't you realize that us Assyrians are the strongest military, military face, uh, army on the earth, uh, the, the face of the earth. I'm trying to preach too fast. I got time, right? I'm going to slow down. Can I slow down a little bit? Okay. This is the time. <laughs> a little faster. He, 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 listen, folks. He, he, he began to say, don't you realize we are the strongest military force on the face of the earth? And, and, he, and he's, trying to, he's trying to intimidate the people, trying to scare them. And, and he was quite success, successful. And in fact, this generation came forward to give birth and couldn't find strength to do so. There's a lot of intimidations in life. 
okay? Whether they be internal in the church or whether they be internal in our hearts or whether they be on the exterior of the church, okay? I don't want to talk about the exterior of the church because we're in the world, we're just not of it. Okay, we need, to make that, we need to make that choice in our own personal lives. Okay, so here you've got this guy trying to, trying to intimidate the, the nation of Israel. But you know what? Hezekiah did not blink an eye. He went to the right source. He got under the right, he got under the right influence. He got under the right counsel. You'd be surprised. Prophets, are not, they're not interested in what's popular. They're interested in the will of God. They're interested in keeping generations in the earth on course correctly. And a lot of times it's just easier to chase what's popular than to stand up and be who you really are. Because if you start chasing what's popular, you'll lose your identity. And then what will happen is you'll lose your ability to birth and you'll have to start borrowing out of desperations. I'm going to be who I am. You be who you are. And don't let anything try and paralyze you to keep you from rising up and being the person that God has purposed to change the earth with. Yeah. 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 Everybody in this room's mover and shakers. You are. You just don't know it yet. Okay? So here's this guy trying to flex and he's trying to intimidate. He's trying to paralyze. And Hezekiah didn't blink an eye. You know where Hezekiah went? Hezekiah went to the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy declared to Hezekiah, the God that you serve, Hezekiah, he's king of kings and lord of lords. And there's no greater God than the God that you serve, Hezekiah. He didn't buckle. He didn't break. Why? He went to the book of Deuteronomy. He pulled from Deuteronomy scriptures like this. The God that you serve will give you the ability to dispossess even nations that are greater than you. Yes. Yes. Amen. He wasn't worried. No. But you'd be surprised if you don't stay close to the right resources, you'll begin to dwindle in your correct influence and you'll begin to entertain soulish things that you think are spiritual things. And what happens is people start getting weakened in true divine nature or from true divine nature and they start getting into appeals like, well, doesn't God care about me? You see, when you put yourself before God's process, now all of a sudden it's out of order. And the church has been in this, this, this thing for quite some time. And it's time for us, I'm telling you, friends, something's coming. Yeah, yeah. We haven't even begun to see it yet. I'm telling you, glory to God. I go home from church now. You know, I was in a meeting in New York, and, and, and I'm, I'm talking about like a, well, like afraid to kind of breathe atmosphere. And I said, God, I said, what do you want me to do? And he quickly spoke. And he said, he said, it's not about what I want you to do. It's about what you want me to do. I went, what? <laughs> I said, I want every person saved that needs to be saved in this room. I want every person healed that needs to be healed. I want every person delivered that needs to be delivered. I want every person that needs a miracle to get a miracle. And heaven blew the place up. <laughs> yeah. I come into every church service. I can't rabahasai. I can't. I came into this church service. God, I want every lost person saved. I want every oppressed person delivered. I want every healed person, person that needs to be healed. I want them healed. I want miracles in the building, God. If you've, that's what I want, Pastor. That's what I've been praying this morning. God, I want you to just be you. I want this place to, to be a place where you showcase yourself where the attention and the attraction is in the right place. It's on you. Hey Amen. We've got enough prima donnas out there, okay? You know, people that got egos that need to preach and all that stuff. I just get out of the way and let God move. Amen. And as soon as the wind blows in here, I'm getting out of the way. I'm just letting you all know, okay? So we, you got this, this paralyzation that's trying to take place, okay? And Hezekiah didn't blink. Now, there's other, there's other stories in the Bible that I want to bring into light here real quick. And, and the focus, you got to remember something. The focus is not always on the present. Decision-making concerning the future is often in the present. But we got to always be thinking about the, the effects of our decisions. Look at Lamentations, chapter 5. 
Yeah, there's a book in the Bible called Lamentations. I love preaching from these Obadiah and Ezra. And, I mean, those, those are revelatory stuff, man. It really is. So watch what happens here in, in, in Lamentations, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, I believe it is. We have given our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Now, this was asked after Hezekiah. Okay, and I will tell you that what we need in America is we need strong leadership. Okay, I said strong leadership. Okay, you might not like strong leadership, but that's what we need. Okay, and in verse 7, our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. So decision making in the present is huge because it affects the future. Okay, so we have to remember that, that this, is, this is what's taking place. Okay, there's a generation that's been trying to give, give birth there but can't find the strength because of what they're, what they're fearful of. All right, and I will talk about that here in a minute. But in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, there was another story here that's very interesting to me. One man from Gath appeared before the nation of Israel for 40 days and 40 nights, morning and evening, and his name was Goliath. Okay, now, David is, is, a, is a powerful symbol, it, it, you know, uh, identity in the Bible, and I love David. And, and, and David has just been, he's just been doing his assignments. He's out tending sheep. He's the eighth man from, you know, eighth son of Jesse, and, and, and nobody really thinks too highly of David, okay? When David was really a new beginning, okay? I, I'm here to pro prophesy over you today that you're in a season of new beginning. Okay, now what, what, what happened? We know that David was summoned, okay, but he's out there and he's just, he's just being faithful. You know what's interesting to me? When you study David, normally there's always, you know, terminology about sheep around David because he had a shepherd's heart. He, 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 he loved people, okay? So now all of a sudden he's just doing what his father's told him to do and he's killing bears and killing lions and strumming, you know, strumming songs and singing before the Lord. Now, all of a sudden, he's summoned one day, I want you to take bread and cheese to your brothers on the front line. And David said, well, okay, not a problem. I'll do what you ask. I, you know, I love anybody that uses bread and cheese to get in a fight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not, looking to, you know, I'm not looking to square off just to square off, but when the fight comes, I'm up for it. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Okay, so he, he, when he gets there, he's just totally shocked. We know the story. He, here's Goliath appearing you know, well, in David's presence, and, and David is instantly provoked. Something down on the inside of him. I'm telling you, the lion killer rose up. The bear killer rose up. What I'm trying to tell you is if there was a Goliath in front of you, it means that there's a David in you. Okay? And, and it just provoked him. And, and, and then everybody wanted to help David fight. Have you ever noticed that you know, everybody's got answers for your life, but they don't have answers for their own? Don't hang out with them people. Hang out with people that you can see. They got fruit. <laughs> they got in their life what you desire, what you want. Hang out with people like that, okay? So we know that he's trying to get dressed with Saul's armor. David's looking at it. He's going, there's no dents in it. There's no dust on it. No scratches on it. It's untested. I don't need this. And God gave him a plan. God always has a plan. Go down to the brook and choose Five smooth stones. Now, not any old stones gonna do. First Peter chapter two and verse five. Are they not all living stones? The minute you get born again is the minute that you become alive. You are a, you, you're a living stone. Now go down to the brook and choose five smooth stones. All kinds of variables that we can preach. We can preach that the fivefold ministry belongs in the shepherd's back. We can preach that, you know, uh, Goliath had four brothers and David had a bigger plan than just killing him. But I got a feeling that David, David was thinking within his heart, he was licking at his chops and he's saying, This cat's too big to miss. Right? I mean, something took over. The gift of faith must have took over. Are you aware that seven out of the nine gifts of the Spirit were in operation in the Old Testament? That's the reason why these guys moved in the juice that they moved in. 
Amen. And you know what? We're not any different. Now you and I have the fulfillment of the other two, tongues and interpretation of tongues. Ooh, somebody help me. We've stepped into some finality here. I'm telling you, there's something down on the inside of you that's just trying to get out. Go down to the brook and choose five smooth stones. Now, why just not any old stone in the brook? You can be in the brook, but not an effective giant killer. To see the stones that are in the brook that are just kind of around the edges, they've got rough, coarse exteriors to them. And you, if you were to put them in a sling and throw it at a target, they would either stray left or stray right. They would abort in accomplishing the task. But the reason God chooses five smooth stones is because the smooth stones come from a place of all in. They come from a place where the current is. They come from a place where the flow is. And it's in that, in that decision of being all in and being under the current and around the flow that the stones start rubbing on one another. What I'm trying to tell you is when you start getting irritated with yourself, you're in the right flow. What I'm trying to tell you is when, when your brother or your sister is provoking you to a good work, you're in the right flow. What I'm trying to tell you is when your children are driving you crazy, you're in the right flow. What I'm trying to tell you is when you're under the right pressure, you're in the right flow. When you're dealing with the right trials and tribulations and testings, you're in the right flow. Something's rubbing on you and you just got to let it rub on you and you got to let it rub on you because what's being rubbed off of you is something on the exterior that's going to maybe cause you to abort from flying straight on, and yeah. sealing the deal. Yeah. 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 And it could be, I'm just saying, it could be we haven't really considered the process. And maybe that could be the reason why we don't have the character to finish some conquests. Okay? Five smooth stones. So the next time you let somebody rub on you and it wants to provoke you to a different nature than the nature that's going to be needed to rise up and kill giants, quickly discern. Okay? I don't want anything. I don't want anything in my heart that's going to cause me to stray left or right. All right? I, but it means I got to be all in. I mean, it means I got I, I to be in the flow. I got to be, I gotta, I gotta be around the current. Okay? Because something down on the inside of you will rise up. You'll go, who is this guy? And how dare him? <laughs> Amen. You know what will rise up in you? Who, it, it'd be just like Peter. Peter will recognize, no, wait a minute. Something has stepped in that has sucked me right out of revelation and into my carnality. Who is this guy? You'll begin to understand. You'll, you'll start living in a different sensitivity. You'll start, you'll start operating in a different discernment. Okay? Let me quickly give you another stone story. Would that be all right? Yeah. Remember when Israel's leaving the wilderness and they've come to the river Jordan? And I will say this is what, it's a shadow and type of where the church is. This year we are leaving some wilderness behind. I'm here to prophesy to you that where you've never been fruitful, get ready to have fruit 12 months out of the year. Yeah. That is possible. Ezekiel chapter 47, the trees that were planted by the river that flowed out of the house of God bore fruit all 12 months out of the year. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Come on, amen. Yeah. Okay, so we have to know that they're getting ready to leave the wilderness and they come to the Jordan. There's a lot of prophetic understanding there, but we know that the waters parted. They went across to the other side, but what were the instructions as they were leaving the Jordan? Take 12 stones with you from the middle of the river, yeah. not just any old stone. You gotta take, to, oh, I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to appeal to you right now is this, what, what this messenger from the Assyrians was trying to do to this generation that were now finding themselves in prophetic timing concerning birthing their destiny. I'm telling you, these stones are symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. Take these 12 stones with you. They gotta come from the middle. They gotta come from the flow. They gotta have, they gotta be smooth. They, 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 they've gotta, they gotta be around the currents. And you're to carry them everywhere you camp. You're to carry them. Not so much just to testify to the generation that maybe killed some Goliaths, but the generations that would come after us that would ask questions about why are you carrying them rocks? 
You see, the process in your life, it's to memorialize victories in your children's lives. Younger generations need to look at your life and say, you know, how did you do that? How did you get manna to come from the sky? How did you make water flow from a rock? How did you make, you know, the lilies bloom in the desert? How did you, how did you, how did you do this? Young people, they got questions. They got questions. And see, the biggest question that they're asking right now is, how come you're trying to make me look like your process? Why don't you identify with me in the realm of I need to identify with my own process? And in the understanding of this, the older people have the opportunity to come full circle. See, I love generations. I, I love it when young people come into church because I believe that they're sent to save the church from themselves. Because we're, we're, we're people of habit. We're, 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 we, we, like, we like things in routine. But you know, the kingdom is always moving. Always moving. You came out of a river. You came out of a brook. It's always moving. Right? Okay, so we have to remember that these young people come in and, and, and see the wrong thing to do. The wrong thing to do is come to church and want it my way. Right. Come on. The right thing to do is to come to church with the understanding is what does God want to do? And I'll guarantee you this, normally God is up to ministering to the young people. Oh, see the wisdom in this, folks. You know Why? Because now all of a sudden a set of needs have entered our lives that we've never ministered to before. And they are positioning us to finish well by appealing to us to be open to yielding to ministry that we've never tasted of before. Okay? So now they're finishing. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing well because of you. This is why I love young people. I love young people. Amen. You know, <laughs> my, I, you know I, try, I try and talk like young people and it just doesn't work, you know. <laughs> you know, they, they say some things and, and now I've even got English sons in the Lord and they say some things and it just doesn't sound right so I just got to be me. But I love young people because the first thing that they'll do is, is if I got any kind of a manual over any kind of, you know, technology that I've just purchased, what they'll do is they'll just want to chuck it out the window. Yeah. You don't need that. I'm here. Love you, man. But you better be available at three in the morning when I need you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Love young people, okay? But what happens is young people get a bad taste in their mouth about church because church has a tendency to stop growing. And many times what happens is we come to church and as a generation and because we've stopped growing, we've stopped evolving, we've stopped maturing, we've stopped you know, letting God polish us so that we can not only kill giants to show young people, hey, look, giant killing is available. Young people travel with me. They got all kinds of questions. How did that happen? Oh, my God. I've never seen anybody get out of a wheelchair. I've never seen the blind see. I've never seen the deaf hear. I've never seen that before. How did that happen? How did that happen? How did that happen? How many realize that when Jesus, Jesus' the disciples came to him in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, when he came, they said, hey, teach us how to pray like John the, John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. What were they saying? They were associating the, the miracles with prayer. They were associating the miracles with the influence that was on Christ. Not teach us how to walk on water. Not teach us how to cleanse the leper. Teach us how to pray. They were identifying. You don't think the young people are sharp? They're sharp. They can spot a con a mile away. Oh, come on. I love young people, man. I just love young people. <laughs> we can get in some serious trouble together. I'm just saying. Amen. Amen. But I tell you, you know how it happens? You got to be willing to be, have an ear. You got to develop an ear to hear the Lord. Young people, you, because they have been so neglected because the church has not understood the process, the millennials are huddling to themselves and they're protecting themselves and they're thinking that we're going to find and arrive at our answers ourselves. It's not going to happen. That's not the kingdom process. And God, you know, young people are not going to act right until fathers act right. 
But we find ourselves in a place where young people are having to act right so that the fathers can finally be run down and be forced to act right. But that's not the process. And when, when generations stop growing, what, ha, what they have a tendency to do, they have a tendency to just kind of migrate and just kind of sit and, and just kind of exist. And then young people come in and they've got ideas and they've got creativity and they've got a fresh flow. And then we want to kind of be resistant. Ooh, we, I, I, <laughs> amen, I'm trying to be real nice. <laughs> All right, I don't want to blow nothing up, man. You had a great day yesterday. I don't want to blow nothing up. <laughs> okay, and, and, and instead of understanding that these young people are trying to rescue us, but you know what you and I do? We're concrete in our thinking. We're, 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 we're just, you know, we, we let all these fresh uh, uh, approaches, you know, what they're, what they're doing is they're flushing us from insecurities, flushing us from inferiorities. And they're, and they're really appealing to us and showing us, my goodness, there's more potential in me than I thought. I can't have an I-10. Need some help, man. <laughs> young person, yeah, young person, yeah, young person. No, no, I'm just, not my, I'm just, I'm just saying young person, okay? Okay. <laughs> Y'all relax, all right. One of the first things that they asked me this morning, Pastor, where's your shoes? Like, what's wrong with my shoes? They were looking for my fly shoes, you know. I said, the older I get, the, the, older I get, the more comfortable I'm trying to get, you know. I guess I'm preaching to myself today, right? All right. So what happens is these young people come into church, and because we're not moving, we're not maturing, we're not developing, can I encourage you, the kingdom will never be done with you until you draw your last breath. If sin is not satisfied until you die, then the kingdom isn't either. Okay? So if we'll stay evolving and growing and maturing, what will happen is we'll stay on the cutting edge because these young people will force us there. All right? And then we, you, technology, let, let, let me just say something to you about te technology. I love lighting. I love smoke. I love technology. I love all that. Okay? But it can't replace your prayer closet. Come on, young people. All right, you want me to step up and meet you where you're at? You better step up and meet me where I'm at, and I'll show you how to open the eyes of the blind. Because if you'll get in your prayer closet, if you'll get around the, G the Jesus kind of prayer life, if you'll get around the John the Baptist kind of prayer life, what you'll find is you'll find, even though we want to stay progressive and we want to stay on the cutting edge, nothing can replace kingdom structure. You can't replace it. Okay? So are we cool with that? All right, let's roll, man. All right, we're good. All right? So we got young people that are asking questions. And I've come to encourage you today. I've come to exhort you today that I believe with all my heart that we're in a time where God is trying to hand the mantle. Not forgetting about the older and not forgetting about the younger because we're all coming into this fulfillment of a correct cycle. Okay? We need them, whether we like it or not. And they need us because we got money. Yeah. <laughs> it's the truth. Isn't it the truth? Okay. <laughs> Come on, man. I had a young person ask me before we left last night, you want to go to Chick-fil-A? I'm in. <laughs> Amen. We, we need one another, okay? The thing is this. We don't need paralyzations, okay? We, we, we don't need to scout out our favorite locations to sit in. Well, the pastor didn't shake my hand and I'm upset. I'm amazed at what people get upset over in church. I really am. Well, they, they changed. I, I, I walked in here and I saw the, I saw the, the, the tapestries and, and, and the light. I said, man, that's cool. I like the change. I love change. I love transition. I, this, is, this is the beauty of the kingdom. Something fresh is waiting on us all. Yes, yes, yes. But people get, people get all kinds of strange. Well, you know, they want me to do this. And, and you know, I don't want to work at the nursery. There's a guest speaker this morning. And, and I, I don't want to do this. And, and I don't want to do that. And, and, and how come somebody's sitting in my anointed seat? 
you know, people, all this stuff that goes on, well, they didn't sing my song. Well, maybe they needed to sing a different song that you'd finally get delivered from yourself. We, we want to get we want to get offended when we don't understand the act of offense. The act of offense is a missed opportunity to honor God. It's time for us to quit appealing to the selfishness of our flesh and, and the immaturity of our staleness and our non-growth relationship with God because somebody has come along that's excited. You ever notice you let somebody, somebody that might be born again for three months and they come into a church service where God's moving and they're going, what? People that's been around for 30 years. Case in point. I'm just saying. Okay? My encouragement to you today is there's a lot on the, on the table right now. We don't need to let this year finish unfulfilled. We need to discern the moment. We need to discern the times. We need to recognize that God is asking us to get into sync with him. God is asking all of us to be all in, not just some, all of us. Many hands make light work, church, okay? And what will happen is generations will be able to be launched into giant killing in their own generation from us, from us. Okay, amen, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be with these precious people today. Lord, I, I, I sensed in my heart, I sensed from the very beginning, I felt your presence, I felt your power. And Lord, I'm just thankful for what you're doing at Freedom Tabernacle. God, this is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Next year is gonna freak us out. This is gonna be awesome. But God, we're just gonna do what we need to do right now in the moment to be able to be ready for what's coming. So if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your heart, you've never repented of your sins and you need to do that, you, you know in your heart you need to do that. You might say, I wanna get saved today. Would you lift your hand and say, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I wanna be born again. I wanna be saved. I wanna repent of my sins. All right, everybody saved in the house. Next week, make sure that there's at least 10 people that need to be saved in the house. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Why? Because it's what, it's what God's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? You know what I tell congregations when I do revivals? Don't let me outwitness you in your own community. Because you go anywhere with me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm saved. I'm, I'm on the clock. God's full of eternity. I'm the one that's, my time's limited. Amen? Okay.